Hi everyone. Um, my name is Eugene Jang, and I'm a PhD student in the Department of English at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, currently, I'm doing my teaching at Pitt as a graduate student instructor. And last spring, I taught an undergraduate course introduction to Shakespeare in the Department of English. Um, and I'm an international student from South Korea. Um, I got this opportunity to participate in, the, in this talk at the Cooper Siegel Community Library as Kelly contacted me. And I was very excited when um, Kelly asked me to do this recording. Um, during the last few years, I have always wanted to engage more with the Pittsburgh community to meet new people and support um, those who are interested in studies of literature. So before I begin my talk, I um, wanted to express my gratitude to Kelly. So Kelly, thank you so much for giving me this chance to participate in this um, program at your library. I really appreciate it. So let me um, share my screen so that um, I can begin my talk about Shakespeare. Okay, so... Um, Okay, so um, the title for this talk is Reading Shakespeare for Pleasure. And I want to begin my talk with this question, how to enjoy reading Shakespeare? Is it possible? So how can you really enjoy reading Shakespeare? Um, I have been interested in exploring different pedagogical approaches to learning or teaching Shakespeare during the last few years. But this, um, Actually, this question is the one that I haven't considered before. Um, I think that we often have many discussions about how to read Shakespeare, especially in classroom environment, or we sometimes question why do we need to um, study Shakespeare, but we do not really talk much about whether reading Shakespeare is indeed on enjoyable work. So I hope that this recording is an opportunity for me um, and for us to think about how we can enjoy reading Shakespeare. And today I also hope that my personal, I also hope to share my personal experiences of reading Shakespeare and teaching undergraduate Shakespeare class at Pitt with you. Um, okay, so while preparing this recording, the first thing that I did was a Google search. So I simply typed how to enjoy reading Shakespeare. And I have, um, I found many blog um, postings or websites suggesting ways to read Shakespeare for pleasure. So these are examples, like how to read Shakespeare and enjoy it, top, top tips for how to enjoy Shakespeare. This is a book published by Robert Thomas Fallon. Um, and I also, and on the website, Cora, I also found that someone asked this question, um, how can I, force myself to read and enjoy Shakespeare's works, which are considered to be English masterpiece pieces. Um, and there are 29 people discussed this question on this online platform. I thought that this question was very interesting. I mean, can we force ourselves to enjoy the process of reading Shakespeare? Or can we really force the enjoyment if not, then how can we make reading Shakespeare enjoyable? Is it possible? So having these questions led me to further think about possible reasons why we cannot enjoy reading Shakespeare. And perhaps as mentioned by the person who made this posting on Quora, um, it is partly because Shakespeare's words are considered as such a great masterpieces. Um, maybe that's part of the reason why we feel Shakespeare so much difficult to read. And um, particularly considering Shakespeare's works as classics, which is fundamentally linked to pre-modern history, philosophy or culture, um, can make us feel that Shakespeare is hard to understand and interpret. But I think this is actually not true. Um, interpretations of Shakespeare have been changed a lot from past to present in scholarly as well as known academic environment, including situations that we encounter every day in our daily lives. Um, this actually suggests that 
we as modern audience or consumers of postmodern culture are allowed to produce new meanings while experiencing Shakespeare in our lives. Um, so I want to emphasize that everyone does not need to feel overwhelmed by the fact that Shakespeare's works are such a great masterpiece um, or classics when we try to um, interpret Shakespeare from our personal perspectives. And nowadays, um, we are also able to encounter different Shakespeare adaptations um, that are not only based upon Shakespeare's plays, but also related to what is happening in our contemporary society. Um, so I hope that you can utilize all possible resources um, in your surroundings as much as you can in order to experience Shakespeare in our contemporary culture um, and make yourself feel more familiar to Shakespeare's works. At the same time, although I just mentioned that we are allowed to produce new meanings about Shakespeare, I still think that we should not disregard what Shakespeare tried to express in his text, which means do, doing a close reading of his place is still very important, especially to genuinely enjoy reading and understanding Shakespeare. So while talking about Pericles as an example to discuss reasons why we need to read Shakespeare's lesser known works, I'll try to explain how um, making close reading allows us to feel more engaged with interpreting Shakespeare. And last part of this recording will be about how we can enjoy Shakespeare in Pittsburgh, which is a great um, artistic and cultural hub where many theaters and events of performing arts thrive. So that's the structure of this recording. So um, first I want to talk about film adaptations of Shakespeare's plays. So um, I would like to begin with discussing how we can use contemporary adaptations of Shakespeare to enjoy reading Shakespeare. And um, I want to focus on the genre of film. As many of online postings suggest, before reading Shakespeare's plays, we can begin with a good Shakespeare movie. And a few examples that I can think about are, or actually these, but there are, um, there are more, of course. So uh, Michael or Moraeva's Hamlet, Kenneth Branagh's Hen um, Henry V, or Justin Purcell's Macbeth, or uh, Michael Redford, The Merchant of Venice. But in this recording, I want to focus on Justin Kurzel's Macbeth as an example to further examine and discuss. Kurzel's version is, of course, based upon Shakespeare's Macbeth, and Michael Fassbender performed the role of Macbeth, and Marianne Cotillard was the lady Macbeth. And in fact, I was teaching, when I was teaching Introduction to Shakespeare last semester, I did the film screening during my class. So after we watched the film, the first question that I asked my student was whether the film was, was faithful to the original. And most of my students responded that the film was very, very faithful to the original. However, when we began to make close analysis of the film, I found that my students' um, thoughts were gradually changed. And this was one of my students' response. In her paper that she submitted after we finished our synchronous Zoom meeting, she wrote that, quote, while Curzel's film adaptation remains largely faithful to Shakespeare's original work with regard to dialogue and plot, it takes many creative liberties in order to depict modern day ideologies. So um, now I want to run a very short video clip, which is about five minutes from the film um, called the Corzo's Macbeth, in order to illustrate how the film is simultaneously faith faithful to the original and is a creative work by the film director. So this clip presents a very well-known scene in which Lady Macbeth is doing her sleepwalking while trying to wash off um, imaginary blood stains from her hands. Um, but before watching the play, I want you to take a look at the specific scene featuring Lady Macbeth's madness in Shakespeare's play. So in Act 5, Scene 1, it is these two characters, Doctor and Gentlewoman, 
for observing the behavior behavior of Lady Macbeth, who is showing her habit of sleepwalking in the king's place of Dunsinane. Lady Macbeth appears with a candle in her hand and spits in a trance that she cannot remove blood stain and she could still smell the blood on her hand. So this is what the original play presents. But Kurtzell's film version um, depicts the scene in a very different way. So let's watch the clip together. So let me stop sharing this. And um, there's some nothing in love. Now does he feel his secret murder sticking on his hands. can call our power to account. Yet who would have thought the old man to have had so much blood in him? Will these hands now be clean? No more of that, my lord. No more of that. You mar all with this tartan. Here's the smell of the blood still. All the perfumes of Arabia will not sweeten this little hat. Wash your hands. Put on your nightcap. Look not so pale.
Um, I hope you enjoy watching this um, clip and let me open my PPT file. Okay. So there are many issues or questions that we can think about in terms of the difference between the scene from the original play and what is presented in this video, in the screen. So firstly, we found that it was not the conversation between doctor and general woman that the film presents, but the filmmaker is doing an extreme close up in order to feature the face of the actress. And the camera focuses on her facial expressions while she's making a speech. Um, we, um, as the audience watching the screen, we believe that we are the spectator of the scene until the moment when a figure of child appears. So when the screen shows the two figures, a child and Lady Macbeth sitting in front of the child, we realize that what has been presented on screen is in fact what is being observed by the child. And the scene was in fact what has been seen from the perspective of the child. Then who is the child? This was a very intriguing question to my students and they provided many different and interesting conjectures about this question. But what we knew very clearly was that is that the child came from the imagination of the filmmaker, not from the original play. In other words, the child on screen was an invention of the filmmaker. So what I just said are examples of topics that we can think further about while trying to interpret this specific moment uh, from the film. The director have already created the scene independently from Shakespeare intention. And I think the films performing the child motif can even resonate situations of contemporary society. And actually the figure of child is um, what is repetitively represented throughout the film. And this is the beginning of the film where the main characters are having the funeral, funeral of, um, of that child. And um, the figure of the innocent child or um, slogans such as the children is our future are often emphasized in our contemporary society. And contemporary ideologies regarding the concept of the child um, in relation to futurity, particularly, are also embedded in contemporary media culture. So we can further discuss whether the film director inc incorporates contemporary social political ideologies into his film adaptation of Shakespeare's Macbeth while making his film still faithful to the original. And after having all these questions, we can begin to read Shakespeare's Macbeth once again in order to consider those issues further by doing close reading. We can have further question, uh, questions, for example, in Shakespeare's plays, what can make the film director imagine and create the symbol, symbol of the child in his film? Or is the figure of the innocent image of the child already existing in Shakespeare's Macbeth, but is this what has been um, less discussed so far? These are examples of questions that we can think about but watching the film first in this way before reading the play um, can help us to engage more with reading Macbeth and produce more meanings while reading the play. As illustrated with the example of Curzel's Macbeth, film versions of Shakespeare's plays not only enable us to um, make ourselves familiarize to the story plot um, of Shakespeare's plays, but also offer many interesting issues that we can think critically about while we read the play, read Shakespeare's play. Our watching film adaptations does not only help us to read Shakespeare, but also lead us to change our views of Shakespeare's plays, or sometimes allows us to reinterpret Shakespeare so that we can have more productive conversations on Shakespeare. Okay, so next section is about Shakespeare's lesser known plays, and I want to use Pericles' Prince of Tyre as an example. So why should we read some of Shakespeare's lesser known works? 
Um, frankly speaking, I have not read all his plays and I am still trying to read Shakespeare's lesser known works whenever I have time. And in fact, I have discussed this question with my student last semester when we finished reading Shakespeare's less famous plays such as Pericles or The Winter's Tale. And I was impressed by my student response, um, responses. One of my students mentioned that reading Shakespeare's lesser known plays not only enabled her to get more used to um, late 16th and early 17th century English, as well as Shakespeare's lexicons, but also allows us to have deeper understandings of contemporary social and historical situations as reflected in Shakespeare's works. So while taking a look at passages from Perry Cole's um, Planks of Tire, I hope that I could explain what my students tried to express um, and actually, this was one of the passages that we examined together in my class. So this play, Pericles, um, Prince of Tyre, is a very special case because it has been known that Shakespeare was not the sole author of this play. Modern editors have indicated that the first half of the play, the first two acts of um, 835 lines, was written by Shakespeare's contemporary writer, George Wilkins, and the rest of the play was written by Shakespeare. And the passage that I want to examine is from scene 12 or um, act four, scene two in some versions that has been known as the part written by Shakespeare. Marina, as so in this play, Marina as a daughter of Pericles, who is a prince of Tyre, is raised by Cleo and Dionysa, but Dionysa plans to murder Marina because Marina grows up more beautiful than her daughter. Um, and Marina is kidnapped and sold to a brothel in Mytilene. And it is this specific moment that is depicted in this passage um, as seen on screen. And while examining this scene, I also want to explain the importance of using footnotes. So as the stage direction, indicates um, three characters, the pendle, Pender, Bolt, and Bolt enter the stage and begin their conversation. So Pender said, search the market narrowly, Italini is full of gallants. We lost too much money to mark by being too anxious. And Bolt said, you are never so much out of creatures. We have but for three, and they can do more than they can do, and they will continue action or even as good as Rodin. Um, here, Pender and Bode are talking about prostitution markets at the place of Mytilene, and the footnote provide more detailed information about the situation as depicted in the scene. For example, the term March means market day uh, for the gallants or young men who want to buy sex at brothel in Mytilene, but the prostitution market at Mytilene has a problem because it is being too anxious. Um, is indicated by bold speech. And um, as, in, um, as, as pointed out by Vault, that we were never so much out of creatures and we have Vault for three, they are experiencing short of prostitutes and three prostitutes have to serve all the clients. And as for Vault speech, um, saying that they can do no more than they can do and they with continual action or even as good as Roden, the footnotes provide further information. So the continual action indicates that the sex trade in both brothel made the prostitute infected with venereal disease. And the footnote indicates, quote, this probably implies that they are so worn out with the continual action that they are as usual as, as if they were completed diseased. And we can read the following conversation between um, Pender and Bolt further while using the footnote in the same way. So I will just read the, um, the speech, speech at the top of this screen. So Bolt says, um, so to Pender, Bolt's response, those say it's true. It's now our, our bringing up a poor bastard. And I think, as I think I have brought up some 11. So Bolt says she has brought up about seven children and made them prostitutes. So they have already raised a number of girls to the profession in the sexual market. And as for this remark, the footnote further adds that 
one of the hazards of the trade at the time was young girls' primitive contraception. Although the background of the story of this play is very ancient time period, and um, the setting is also this Mediterranean Sea, um, or a few places such as like Mytilene, Tarsus, Tyre, or Antioch, um, as seen in the, on the screen, I think like part of this play, um, as Shakespeare's other plays do, also reflect what the author encountered as contemporary social issues, such as prostitution, sexual market, sex trade, venereal disease, practices of contraception or abortion as part of late 16th or 17th um, situations. Um, and as this article, History of Contraception indicates, um, early childbirth, um, birth control or abortion contraception happened in the early modern era. And some of Shakespeare's works reflect these issues. So as seen with the example of the passage from Pericles, doing quote reading and using footnotes while reading the play are very helpful to read Shakespeare. And these themes of early modern sex industry or objectification of the female body and its exchange value are also reflected in Shakespeare's other plays, such as The Rape of Hercules or Measure for Measure. So reading Shakespeare's lesser known works are also allows us to see how Shakespeare's different plays are connected to or resonate with um, each other and makes us understand contemporary social political situations more in depth. So next part is um, experience Shakespeare in Pittsburgh. So I want to talk briefly about resources in Pittsburgh that we can experience in Pittsburgh. And I guess many of you are already um, know about this, but let me just um, um, talk briefly about that. So um, Pittsburgh is such a beautiful city, which provides many great opportunities of experiencing diverse artistic performances. And during the last few years, while staying here, I have found that there are so many performing arts events about Shakespeare. And these are some examples um, performed in the Pittsburgh Cultural District during the last five years. Last year, Pittsburgh Ballet Theater featured A Midsummer Night Dream at Hardwood Acres. Um, and uh, in two, 2014, Pittsburgh Opera has this performance Verity's Otello, which is based upon Shakespeare's play Othello. And if you like Shakespeare's Othello, and if you have any chance, then I really want you, I really want to suggest you to watch this operatic work by Verdi. Verdi's Othello was produced in the late 19th century, and the composer, as well as the librettist, who is Ariga Burrito, maintained many details from the original, but they, they also changed it um, and inserted new parts in their opera. For example, the famous um, area, Ave Maria, on White Desdemona in Act 4, was Verity's invention. In Shakespeare's play, um, Desdemona sings the Willow song in Act 4, but Verity's Desdemona sings one more song, which is Ave Maria, after she sings the Willow. Um, in the prayer, um, Desdemona sings that um, pray for the one who kneels in the prayer before you, and pray for the sinner, and pray for just everyone. So my personal impression is that Desdemona singing the aria makes her sing more innocent and pure than Shakespeare's original. Um, I just really like the music. And Shakespeare's symphony, um, Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra performed Tchaikovsky's Romeo and Juliet in 2015. And I also found that there is a still city Shakespeare Center in New Vale. Um, this company will perform William Shakespeare's play Pericles this year in August. And this performance will be open to the public. So if anyone of you is interested in watching this live performance, um, please go and watch this performance. and read or reread Pericles after you watch the play. So, um, so this is actually all I prepare as, as my PPT. So I think that all those examples that um, have been performed or will be featured in um, Pittsburgh 
illustrate the reason why Shakespeare is still still revered and beloved in our contemporary society and culture. Shakespeare's works are translated or transformed across time and space, and we as modern audience react so effectively to Shakespeare's works and Shakespeare's adaptations. So Shakespeare is still a great cultural capital in our contemporary era, and we cannot underestimate his aesthetic, cultural, or social values that still resonate with many aspects in modern society. So I think there are many interesting issues that we can think about while reading Shakespeare or seeing Shakespearean performances. I hope that, and I hope that you could seek more opportunities of sharing your thoughts about Shakespeare with others in your community whenever possible. I hope you enjoy watching this recording and please feel free to contact me um, if you have any questions or issues that you want to discuss. So this is my email address. So, yeah, so this is my email address. So thank you for listening. Um, thank you so much.